these are the common concerns about electric vehicles, right? The battery degrades, not enough range anxiety. It's too expensive. So let's uh, address some of these at this point. So some new study that just came out was these electric vehicle batteries can outlast a vehicle's lifetime with minimal degradation. According to the study, it's actually gotten better now by almost a quarter in the past five years. So they, they're not only, you know, already pretty good now, but they're going to keep improving as time goes on. So this is vice president of the UK and Ireland at Geotab, a company called Geotab. And they did this study. And what he says is batteries in the latest EV models will comfortably outlast the usable life of the vehicle will likely not need to be replaced. Um, Geotab is a Canadian based fleet management company. They looked at. Um, yeah, so in 2019, the firm reported that EV batteries degrade by 2.3% on average every year. Now the new study is even better. It's now at 1.8%. They looked at 5,000 fleet and private electric vehicles representing nearly 1.5 million days of telematics data. And they looked at the average annual degradation rate. So it's 22% better than when data 2019. And even better, the top performing vehicles, they only had a 1% per year. So this is the average of 1.8% per year. Um, we still see battery reliability being used as a stick to beat EVs with. Hopefully data like ours can finally put these myths to bed. And, um, you know, he explained down here that if so in the case of a Tesla Model Y long range all wheel drive, one of the best selling EVs in the world, its original 320 mile range would go down to 204 miles, which would still be plenty for town driving or even short road, short road trips. This is in 20 years. <laughs> so in 20 years, you would go from 320 to 204. So it's almost like a 30% uh, achieve uh, reduction. What do you think, Johans? Yeah, it's great to see this data. I mean, we've always known that reliability of batteries was really an engineering challenge. And then an engineering especially applied to scaled production of batteries. And to see this data continue to trend in the right direction is really good. And then to see such a low, you know, average degradation amount is really good as well, especially when you highlight, you know, those best in class, that that is where we're headed ultimately. And so, you know, I think within a few years from now, we could be looking at the average degradation being 1% per year instead of that 1.8% per year. Um, and so to see what the leading edge of what we can do is, and then to project forward, you know, I think that this is something that's very encouraging and this is also going to be something that we should look at with the lithium iron phosphate batteries. You know, is that chemistry increases in the overall amount of EVs that use it? Um, I think that's a phenomenal battery chemistry also for degradation. And, um, you know, that's an exciting piece of information to look out for as well that you know as we get better ranges on these lithium iron phosphate batteries and if they're great on the degradation front um, then that's a huge win for consumers and like you said you know really at the end of the day this is a non-issue for people who own the vehicles like once you get into the car and you've driven it for yourself and you understand what the limitations of range are and you know the benefits of home charging assuming that you can charge at home um, then you really can put a lot of these uh, concerns about range anxiety and how often you're going to have to change these batteries to rest and you know man to think about what Jeff Don has been working on that essentially what this data tells me is that we're pretty much there. You know, he talked about having half million mile life mm -hmm. batteries and you may not have the best of range when you arrive at that half million miles worth of travel on a battery pack, but you can get there and you can get there probably better you know more easily with the battery itself than you can with the vehicle that's going to be falling apart around you uh probably multiple times over in that you know half mile or half million mile overall lifespan uh everybody keeps thinking if you buy an electric vehicle that you're going to have to replace that battery do you not know how expensive it is to replace that battery well here we go 20 years from now it's only going to be 36 reduction percent reduction in battery degradation that's not terrible mm -hmm. at all and then if you take a look at this warranty here, Omar pointed out that the myth that you will have to regularly replace your battery at great expense is a total myth. 
New EVs come with 100,000 mile warranties on the battery and drivetrain. Anything happens, it's not your problem. Uh, what's your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, that is a, a great warranty. And then, you know, the, one of the other things that I'll point out is that while, you know, every now and then batteries will need to be replaced, a lot of those replacements do happen inside of warranty. And so the consumer never ends up paying for it. And that is in stark contrast to, you know, a lot of the more recent and specifically GM larger vehicles, you know, they have transmissions that are awful, awful transmissions and they have been redesigned recently and they are not coming with a very long warranty on the transmission. And, um, those transmissions oftentimes go out shortly after the warranty expires and leave owners having to, to foot the bill to get these transmissions replaced and ending up having to replace them with a similarly faulty transmission overall. And those are expensive. You know, it's not as expensive to replace one of those transmissions as it is to replace a battery, um, but it's certainly in the multiple thousands of dollars each time. And if you end up having to do that multiple times, over say a three or four hundred thousand dollar life or a three or four hundred thousand mile lifespan you could definitely spend more in replacing transmissions on an ice vehicle than you would in replacing okay. a battery over that same lifespan and um you know that's just something that we kind of it, it, you know this is going to be manufacturer specific so if you're buying a toyota you're a lot less likely to run into those types of issues than if you're buying a, a gm product or even you know a ford product um i don't think their transmissions are the ones that specifically have issues as often as the the gm products but there are other things that go wrong on a ford more likely and so you really do have to take in the overall reliability of the vehicle and that's where when you look at the data tesla pretty much outshines everything out there so the next um you know thing that we're going to watch for is can the evs revive this the, the the cheaper car in the us because what happened in the us was suvs and pickups killed these low compact cars, the sedans, uh, you can see here in this table from Cox Automotive from 2012. In black here is those cars that are under $20,000. It just basically disappeared. You can't buy a car for under $20,000 anymore. And then, then the darker blue, it's a $20,000 to $30,000. And you can see how it's fallen percentage of um, sales. And then you can see every, every car basically is starting to fall. And what's growing is the $60,000 and up car that's the one that's taking over so that's what's happening recently um and the question is what's going to happen when you've got electric vehicles and especially when tesla comes out with the two more affordable vehicles next year and prices continue to keep falling um yeah quick question uh, thoughts on that well it's definitely yeah inflationary in not only the types of vehicles but you know there's a lot more safety regulation that goes into cars whether it's emission standards whether it's crash standards and all of those things are making cars more expensive overall and i think that has an outsized impact on the cheapest cars in the overall lineup for an individual vehicle manufacturer that if you're trying to sell you know in volume say something like a toyota corolla we won't pick on that specifically uh since you know toyota does continue to sell those um, but if you're ford and you're trying to compete with the corolla with something like a ford focus and all of a sudden you've got these extra regulations that are making your already thin margins on the focus non-existence well of course you're going to abandon that and you're going to move to some of your larger vehicles where you have higher percentages of gross profit and you can eat that a little bit better and i think that's been you know one of the driving forces in just the the removal of these smaller cars from the lineup for a lot of manufacturers and so but the effect of that is it does create <clears throat> kind of a pocket where there's just not supply for these vehicles even though there probably is a greater demand for it and that demand ends up moving more towards the used vehicles instead um, but if you could buy a new car for that lower price point, and not only is it a car that you could buy at a lower price point, but its operating costs are also a lot lower, I think that you're gonna have a lot of demand for something like that. And that is the opportunity that we would love to see Tesla address as quickly as possible. Um, and so we just kind of have to wait to see 
when will that vehicle arrive? What will the volume be that they're able to ramp to quickly? And what will the market response be? I think it'll be favorable on, uh, you know, on the market response side, but we do have to get these vehicles out into the market and we have to get them out in volume. Yeah. They're coming at the right time because it um, looks like the new data shows this is it. You can't really continue selling these cars anymore. Car dealership reported this. New uh, car buyers are hitting a wall. A new survey reveals that many shoppers are facing the sticker shock. New car prices averaged over $47,000 and the loan rates stay above 7%. Today we'll have the Fed come out and maybe they'll do a 25% cut or a 50% basis point cut, but still it's too high interest rates. The average driver hasn't bought a car since 2018. That's what you're saying. They're buying the used cars now. Uh, when prices were lower, interest rates were better. Dealerships offered more deals. Now, nearly half of new car shoppers wait to spend under, want to spend under $35,000 on a new car, over $10,000 less than the average price. What do they do? Used car buyers aren't catching a break either. Only 5% of deals are falling under $15,000. These conditions are forcing consumers to make tough choices, stretch the budget, go smaller, hold off until the market cools down. Craziest part, more than 50% of respondents plan to work more hours or even take on a second job to, face, to fund their next car purchase. So the more affordable cars, I think it's going to have a huge market when it comes out next year. Um, or maybe interest rates will be cut so low that uh, this will revert back. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm... I wouldn't expect the interest rates to go very low, very fast. I'm definitely more in, not that I want this, but I, I just think the most likely outcome is rates are going to stay higher for longer than we want. And then in that environment, um, I think the reason that we are seeing those used car prices remain so elevated is because there is that void of supply of affordable new cars. And so if we can see a supply of new cars that come in at those lower, you know, sub $30,000 price points increase, then I think that will put a little bit more pressure on the used car prices. And then maybe those can come down. I think that that would be good for the consumer um, and a deflationary force, which is needed in the overall automotive sector. All right. So next story here is um, legacy car makers. What's going to happen to them and their EVs? So Alex Voigt said, I said it more than a decade ago, and I am saying it again today. The legacy car manufacturers will pay a high price if they do not fully commit to be EVs, and this price may be for some existential. Here you got many car makers have toned down their ambitious EV targets. Look at every single car maker, and these are all kind of like the restatement of what they think they're going to be able to do for battery electric vehicle. And all of them, all these guys have pushed to, you know, their production target by 30%, by 50%, you know, blah, 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 blah. Each one of them, I won't read all of these out. You can uh, come back to this table and take a look at it. At the same time, you've got one large automaker, legacy automaker going after another, begging governments to lower the CO2 fleet limits because they can't keep paying, you know, the penalties to come to the, the, the Z credits to Tesla. And um, they want to get rid of that uh, requirement because they're, it's going to take them a lot longer to switch from ICE vehicles to BEV vehicles. Um, Volkswagen not selling as many BEVs as they should have has nothing to do with the demand for BEVs, which is growing. That's what Alex Voigt is saying. But with Volkswagen Group's inability to produce affordable and competitive BEVs. Yeah. And then Elon replied to that saying, if they just make great EVs, there's no problem. So after we filmed this segment, this news just came out that the European Commission rebuffs the car industry's calls to delay the carbon monoxide targets. So this uh, just came out. They're saying now that, no, we're not going to be able to uh, push this back as per the requirements by all these automakers. They said that the targets that apply from 2025 were adopted in 2019. So, you know, you had plenty of time. So, and they warn the car makers that they could face fines of up to 16 billion euro if they don't comply by the 2025 target. So my gosh, these legacy automakers are in big trouble. Yeah, I think, you know, I understand the strategy from a legacy automotive standpoint. Uh, it makes a lot of sense to push, say, hey, we're, you know, we're going to put out aggressive targets. We want to, you know, produce X amount of BEVs in 2025. And, you know, we're going to 
take the leadership position from Tesla at that point in time. And you, so you make that type of public statement. Then you go to your government and you say, hey, we're going to need money in order to accomplish these goals. We need lots of subsidies in order to do this. And oh, by the way, we're going to make this carve out here in these subsidies and make sure that our hybrids are included in these subsidies. You know, the premise for getting this subsidy through government is that we're going to be producing BEVs. Um, but then when the rubber meets the road, hey, we're not actually going to produce those BEVs. We're just going to produce these hybrids. And then what you get to do is you get to continue producing your ICE vehicles and putting a little tiny battery and a little tiny electric motor in it that is more than paid for by the subsidy. And so you get to basically steal taxpayer money to continue to run your business the way you always have um, and the way that you would like to continue to run it indefinitely. Now, it's a smart short-term strategy. I think that's not a smart long-term strategy, um, but I understand why these very cynical automakers are pursuing it.